All right. Welcome, everybody. As people are dialing in here, I will just say um, hello. So it's Mark Yusko from Chapel Hill, and I'm excited to talk today about the ABCDs of the digital age. And then I snuck in a little uh, extra on the Web3 protocol stack, which we'll get to. You know, this is our thesis for uh, our new fund inside MCD, Morgan Creek Digital, a uh, new venture fund. We just did the first close on, on Monday. Excited about that and grateful to, to our core investors. But we're going to dive a little more into the, the broader idea of the ABCDs. And, and uh, you can find most of them here in the word cloud. Uh, they don't actually have uh, chips here, but, but uh, they got machines which is really what we're talking about, the computers that and the chips that drive them. Um, but it is all about uh, the AI, the blockchain, the chips, and the data. And I'll explain what, what all that means here as we get into it. So you've seen these quotes before, the secret to change, to focus all your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. Uh, again, 2,600-year-old wisdom. And, and it really is about about building the new. And, and we'll talk about just how new everything is. It's, it's really extraordinary. When the winds of change blow, some people build walls, others build windmills. We'd rather take advantage of, of the change. Again, uh, you know, 3,000-year-old wisdom. Reasonable person adapts to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to themselves. All progress depends on the unreasonable person. We've met lots of unreasonable people. Uh, some examples of that here in the presentation. Uh, and that's the exciting part about venture capital. Uh, I believe you have to be willing to be misunderstood if you're going to innovate. I think that's probably pretty true. And Jeff knows something about innovation. This is a great one, which if, if I'd asked the public what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So what they really wanted was a horseless carriage and then ultimately, you know, electric vehicles, et cetera. But, you know, the the public is usually pretty content with what they have and it takes the innovators who are willing to be misunderstood to, to bring the, the new stuff. I love the guy from the patent office saying that, you know, everything that's been invented has already been invented or that everything that can be invented has been invented back in 1843. Uh, not exactly. Uh, and don't be afraid to take big steps. You can't cross a chasm in two small jumps. Just ask Evil Knievel. Uh, greatest wealth created by being an early investor in innovation, making that investment requires believing in something for a majority to understand it. You'll be mocked and ridiculed and criticized for your non-consensus action, but it's absolutely worth it. It's been my pinned tweet for a few years. So Andy Grove talked about this, that understanding when things change is a superpower, right? It's the most powerful skill there is, but you don't get to wait until you know for sure. In fact, most companies are so paralyzed and they stand still and they don't die because they make a decision and they're wrong. They, they die because someone else outperforms them and, and they just get stuck, you know, looking at the old, like ABC, NBC, CBS, and Netflix. So, you know, talking about computing, we're talking a lot about computing today. You know, back in 1949, everyone, and, and I mean everyone, knew that computers were pretty much done. And you know, Popper Mechanics was saying someday, you know, a computer will only weigh one and a half tons. And Charles Darwin, who's a pretty smart guy, said, you know, I, I think one machine would suffice for each country. And now we have billions and billions of machines. Uh, when things are called a fad, just buy it and buy a lot of it. I love this slide rule is just as fast as a calculator and the batteries won't run out. Uh, anyone actually used a slide rule? It was, it was you know, worthwhile tool at the time, but a calculator is better, a computer is better. And uh, I love this chart on the right. You know, ADP isn't even the best company in the world, automated data processing. And, uh, you know, the guy from Prentice Hall Books said, you know, data processing wouldn't last the year. It's lasted many, many, many decades. And it's actually, you know, done about 3X the S&P. Uh, DEC, you know, said, look, there's no reason anyone would want a computer in their house. We make big mainframes, big iron. And then ironically, they were bought by a personal computer company. Innovation and disruption, it's these long wave cycles that matter. So look, everything from the start of the Republic in the 1700s to really the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, was about muscle power 
to mechanical power, the industrial revolution. And I was I was at this debate last night. Uh, this was kind of cool. So it was myself and, and a couple other digital guys uh, debating a central banker from the, the Richmond Fed. And I give him props for coming. I mean, it was sponsored by the Bitcoin Club and the Harvard Business School Club. And, and it was great. We had a great debate. And and one of the guys, when we were talking about the history of money, said, you know, it was called the Industrial Revolution, not because it wasn't a big deal. I mean, it was a big deal. And it was a good deal. And quality of life went up, you know, exponentially. And it was it was meaningful. But now we're we're in this second part of the revolution, which is where we turn brain power into artificial intelligence and this idea of a cognitive revolution. And so this big bang moment in the 2020s, you know, we believe is around uh, blockchains. And so when you think about how the information age evolved into this digital age and how we set up this cognitive revolution, it, it really goes all the way back to big iron, you know, mainframe computers in 54, and then microchip in 68, the personal computer in 82, the internet in 96, the mobile net in 2010. It's always this 14 year cycle. And now the beginning of next year, uh, is blockchains. And the if you think about what a blockchain is, it's just a better way of capturing and organizing data. And we're going to get to that here in a second. So new technologies uh, are following a common path. They follow these S curves. But the one thing you'll notice is that the S curves on the far right, like podcasting and Amazon Prime and, and you know stuff like that, they're just happening faster. So the adoption rate is faster because technology moves faster. In the last hundred years, we had more innovation, right, than the previous, you know, four centuries. And it's really extraordinary when you think of the pace of innovation from, you know, barely having cars a hundred years ago to now we have, you know, 3D chips and driverless cars and, you uh, you know, everything in terms of high definition television and, and so many innovations. And the math behind it is actually pretty elegant and, and it's compelling. You know, this this guy Sarnoff came along and said, anyone who can hear, like any any of you, so there's 51 on the call today. So Sarnoff would say, well, there's there's 51 nodes in the network and therefore it's a linear relationship. Everyone that, that jumps on the call, we're, we're building the network out linearly. Well, Metcalf came along and said, well, no, some of y'all know each other and some actually talk to one another and there's connections in between the 51. And so there's actually an exponential increase in the value of networks. And communications networks, telephone networks were the best example, computer networks. But Reed came along and said, well, well, wait a second there's actually even subgroups within the big group. So of the 51 on the call, some like tennis, some like golf, some like swimming. I don't really understand that group and no, I'm just kidding around. Um, I think. But uh, there, there's exponential growth that then accelerates again because of the interconnections on, on the edge. And I've come up with something that I, I nicknamed after a, a friend of mine, Sophia Vachetto, called Vachetto's Law. I think the 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 connections themselves are dynamic. They vary. Some are wide, some are narrow, some are active, some are inactive. And so there's this fourth derivative that I think can increase the growth of networks even faster as you widen the pipes. So networks create massive opportunities. Expenses grow linearly uh, on the right and uh, profits can grow exponentially because revenues grow exponentially as networks expand because you don't get a linear growth, you get exponential growth. Uh, the most valuable companies in the world today are networks, right? They, they are not companies the way we think about companies. They don't control property, plant, and equipment. They control networks. And the networks make up, you know, 15%, 1-5% of the market cap. Uh, and they've resulted in the largest company in the world. Uh, the digital age, I think this is interesting, right? The largest hospitality company doesn't own any physical property. Largest transportation company in the world doesn't own any vehicles. And digital disruption is going to impact every industry. In fact, if you think about, you know, things like 5G and AI and ML and 
and social authenticity and, and identification, digital identification, cybersecurity, squarely in the middle of all of this uh, is, is digital assets in the digital age. Now, here's something that it's incomprehensible. This is what just math is, is hard. It's one of my hashtags. That over the next 50 years, technology will increase a quadrillion X. And it just doesn't seem possible. It's just the law of large numbers. When you're doubling and doubling and doubling, it will increase that. And there are things that we just can't comprehend. Now, will the Jetsons get everything else right? Will we have flying cars and Rosie the Robot and all that stuff? I don't know. But the things that we can't imagine are the things where innovation is going to be the best and, and the opportunity sets going to be the biggest. So into the ABCDs, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, computing infrastructure or chips, and big data. So these are the four pillars of the digital age. They are the foundation of Web3, and they are the pillars of our Morgan Creek uh, digital uh, funds. We, we invest in these four areas, uh, artificial intelligence in the upper left, computing infrastructure and, and chips, uh, blockchain technology uh, and the protocols around it, and then, and then big data. And the way really to think about this is the first three, A, B, C, are really ways of capturing, analyzing, and acting on the D, on the data. So the internet is evolving. So we had web one, right? Web one made information bi-directional and it was read only, right? You could consume Encyclopedia Britannica in Wikipedia form, and that was an improvement. Then web two came along and it was read write. Now we could stream things, we could make payments, we could shop. And the thing is the centralized companies made all the money. Uh, so web one generated about $2 trillion of value. Web two created about $5 trillion of value. And we think web three, because of this exponential S curve like growth in a decentralized world, we think it'll generate closer to 10 to $15 trillion of wealth. So let's dive into artificial intelligence, acting on data. You know, it's a 75 year overnight success story. Um, 70 plus year overnight success story. You know, it, it's, it goes all the way back really into the 16 and 1700s. Uh, people have been trying to create machines that would do the work of, of the brain and people like Blaise Pascal, uh, Ada Lovelace, who, who wrote the first computer program. Um, now they don't really get credit for AI because that really took Alan Turing devising this test to give us the way a machine thinks and a, a measurement of how a machine can think. The term artificial intelligence was coined in 1955. Uh, you know, I love the fact that, you know, 1980 uh, was the year of AI, right? So, you know, AI has been around a long time. It was the year of AI in 1980. Uh, it supposed to change all of our lives and it, and it started to change our lives. And then, you know, AI was adopted by, Amazon and Amazon has lots of cool AI functions. It makes nice recommendations based on what other people like. Uh, and there are a lot of other companies that do that, Pandora, et cetera. Um, you know, computers got smarter and smarter. They they beat the chess champion. And then in 2016, they beat this, this Go player. That's a big deal. Go is orders of magnitude harder than chess. Uh, it's a game of, of regional or relative advantage around the board as opposed to a direct conf confrontational uh, game like chess and checkers. Um, but it was a big deal. And, but Intel in 20, in 2000 was supposedly going to change the world with their AI and their stock went up 20 fold. Uh, and now it's down 75% since then, because they didn't really uh, do much with it. So uh, AI has been forecast to change the world for a long time, right? So this is a view from 1989. You know, we dove deep into the re-emerging project developing brain style computers and their future in the next two decades. And they basically said within two decades, you know, we would have a computer as smart as the human brain. Not close, not close. So there's a lot of debate on, on what actually is AI. 
So the goal is to be as smart as a human. Okay. That, that is the goal. And, but there's a lot of different elements or, or components along the way. So there's this idea of deep learning. So what is deep learning? So a computer can, can study a very large set of data and, and by studying, it can actually study more than a human, right? It's just, faster processor and and can study more, can see more. Uh, but then it had to be able to interpret language. So natural language processing and, and this idea of machine learning. So whether machine is actually learning from itself as opposed to being programmed. And, and we've made good strides there. And and ultimately that moves outward on the on the circle to this idea of of intelligence. And so if you think about machine learning and on the left hand side, you know, you've got supervised learning where you're you're telling it what to look at. Then there's this idea of unsupervised learning where you, you basically turn it loose on society and let it learn. And then you kind of reinforce areas that you want. Um, and then you're like targeting uh, an area of specific development that, that you would like the AI to focus on, like a, a large language model. Now, the evolution, okay, is from narrow to general to super consciousness. So, you know, machine learning was, was a narrow form of AI. So it was machines got smarter, right? They could beat the chess champion, then they beat the Go champion. But the real goal is this thing, AGI, uh, general intelligence where a machine would would cross like the blood brain barrier it would be smarter than a human and you know, i listened to the guy from world coin he's co-founded with with the guy from sam altman from from open ai and he was at this conference last week in austin and i listened to him and he said you know we're we're two years away from agi I'm like look and this guy was super smart. I mean, like incredibly smart, Caltech, AI specialist. I, 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 maybe he knows. I I just, I don't see it in terms of people that we talk to. Uh, they don't think it's that that close. But, but uh, I think there's a randomness to human intelligence that I think is just going to be really, really difficult for, for computers to, to match. But, but we'll see. Ultimately, what people believe is that, you know, the Terminator is coming, that they're going to have this super intelligence, um, machine consciousness. I'm going to take the under on that one. I, I, I really don't believe we're going to get um, to that to that level, but but we'll see. So AI clearly accelerated in the past decade, particularly around these these large language models. And you can see, you know, the the progression on the left hand side that basically from 2012 uh, to 2023, when we, you know, basically developed these ideas of of large language models, and you know, the GPT part, the gener uh, the uh, generative, oh shoot, what's the P stand for? It doesn't matter. Transformer, uh, you know, was was pioneered by Google. Actually, they released it into the public domain they made it open source and then open ai picked it up and and built this this chat gpt and you can see on the right hand side it took netflix three and a half years to get a million users you know kickstarter two and a half years twitter two years dropbox two months spotify or seven months spotify five months chat gpt five days i mean it is pretty incredible now I'm one of those, and I've used ChatGPT about a dozen times. You know, I, I played with it, asked it some questions. It gave me back actually pretty crappy answers, and I just said, this is not useful to me. Now, I guess if I were writing blog posts every day, it, it probably would be useful to me. If I were trying to program code uh, for, you know, basic level stuff, uh, it might be useful. But but I couldn't find a use case for it. Um, but I'm sure other people have, and and it's probably very very compelling, but it's just one part of AI. So uh, there are decades where nothing happens and then there are weeks where decades happen. So this was a week in the life of the adoption uh, and integration of LLMs. Every tech company, 
from Microsoft to Google to NVIDIA to Adobe to everybody jumped on this. Meta basically abandoned their name, right? They changed their name to Meta for the Metaverse. They basically abandoned it and they, they probably need to change their name to Met AI because all they do is talk about AI. Their last earnings call was just pathetic. How many times they mentioned the word AI? Not as bad as NVIDIA, which I think actually said the word AI over 200 times. That's what someone told me. But look, AI is being integrated all around us. It is an amazing tool for making decisions from data. So it can process data really fast. So, you know, it can learn fast. It can do predictive analytics. So it can take data and say, what's the next thing in the series? That's basically what an LLM is. It looks at the previous words and says, what's the next word going to be? And it makes a guess based on history. So at, you know, finding old press releases and copying them, it's pretty good at that. But it, the problem is the data is usually old, so you can't ask it to do new stuff. Like I said, you know, all right, I play Magic the Gathering. Tell me a, uh, the best deck to play in the metagame today. And it couldn't do that, right? Because the data was two years old. So, you know, it will get better, but, you know, there are limitations for for what it's useful for. And then on the right-hand side, you know, the top AI use cases going forward. Look, we all know customer experience. We've all talked to chatbots and they're much better than they used to be. In the supply chain, in human resources, fraud detection, great use case. So, you know, one of our portfolio companies, Figure, uses AI to determine if someone who's applying for a mortgage um, has a potential to commit fraud, right? They can look at their data uh, and analyze it from an AI perspective and and make you know predictions about how they're going to be as a as a customer. Um, you know, research and development, uh, all these things are potential use cases. And every industry is probably going to be impacted uh, and and utilize AI. Now, the biggest problem for AI is there's really not a lot of ways to play AI directly in the public market. So in the private markets, tons of ways to play. Now, the problem is we see it, the valuations of private AI companies have gone absolute crazy town. I, you know, we've passed on so many deals recently because um, they're just, they're just ridiculous. And I think those people are going to lose a lot of money, but there are a few public companies that, that kind of are related to, to AI. So you got Mang Man. So that used to be Fang Man, but that's, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, Apple, and NVIDIA. So we'll get to NVIDIA and and uh, the chip companies in a little bit. But, you know, Microsoft is a company that people think is a big AI play. And look, it's up 45%. It's up three times as much as the market in the past year. It's pretty cool. So, but there's this uh, company, Meta, right? Which they basically uh, started talking about AI not that long after ChatGPT was released. And then they actually did a showcase in June of their new AI tool suite. And the stock has gone up a lot, right? It's up 135% with the market up 15%. Now it had fallen a lot before that when they went and changed their name to Meta. So maybe it's just gaining some of that back. But, you know, I, I think of all the companies out there, they probably have so much data that they can train some really interesting models and 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 integrate AI probably better than most. So uh, blockchain technology, the B, it's all about capturing and organizing data. Now, blockchain technology evolved from cryptography. And, and this is pretty cool. So Scott Stornetta is one of our venture partners. Uh, for Morgan Creek Digital, and it's really an honor. I mean, he and his partner, Stuart Haber, coined the term blockchain. I mean, they literally were sitting around trying to solve hard problems. He's a physics PhD and and uh, early uh, pioneer in, in AI. And, and he came up with this term uh, blockchain back in 1991. And then based on all of his incredible work, uh, when Bitcoin was created, the Bitcoin white paper was released, he and his partner were 
quoted, uh, sort of cited three times in the footnotes. So, you know, it's kind of cool to have somebody on the team that that is really tied in, not just to blockchain itself in terms of creating the word, but also uh, AI chips and, and just about anything to do with cryptography. Scott is uh, an incredible resource and, and has helped source a, a bunch of great deals for us. So, you know, distributed ledgers, it's not really anything new. It's just an evolution of accounting. So we had, you know, single entry accounting, clay tablets and papyrus, and then we went to tally sticks and ledgers, dual entry accounting. Now we have triple entry accounting where every entry in ledgers is confirmed and validated by everyone in the world through this distributed network. So we're replacing trust with truth. So we don't have to trust the other party in the ledger transaction. We don't have to trust a third party, like an auditor or an accountant or a bank to validate the transaction. We actually have computing directly uh, validating truth and establishing truth. So blockchain is going to impact every industry, every business model from healthcare, uh, better forms of, of owning and controlling our data, our health data to retail, to voting, uh, insurance, you know, making sure that there's less fraud, more claims getting paid and on time, supply chain improvements, uh, really extraordinary use cases. And, and we've said this, that, you know, we think the blockchain era will usher in unprecedented wealth creation, right? Three or four times as much as, as Web2. And it's basically from the decentralization of trust and being able to transact value peer to peer directly without a financial intermediary. This will revolutionize financial services and financial services are not too happy about that. And they're doing everything they can from lawsuits to regulation to everything to fight back. But blockchain will become the beating heart of the new financial system. Look, banks have been under attack for a long time. People don't go to the bank to get a mortgage anymore. They go online. They do peer-to-peer -peer lending. They they pay with a card instead of you know cash. So banks have been under attack for a long time. One of the interesting things about the world is 40% of adults in the world don't have a bank account, but most of them have a mobile phone. So we can deliver financial services directly through blockchain technology uh, through the mobile phone. Uh, it enables the transition to the digital age. So no more analog pieces of paper, physical pieces of paper, like stock certificates and bond coupons, uh, where you had to clip them, right? Literally cut them out with scissors and send them in. We're going to go away from that and even away from the electronic age, which is pretty expensive, to the digital age where we're truly global. We put significant pressure on fees. And with blockchains, we can reduce about $7 trillion of friction every year that's lost uh, in the trust industry. About $14 trillion trades every year, $700 trillion around the world. The Economist has been talking about this for 30 years plus. In 1988, they said we would have a world currency uh, called the Phoenix. Satoshi came along and created it in 2009, and Scientific American said it's the future of money. I just did a debate last night. Uh, with a Fed governor talking about the future of money. There's actually a recording of it online, which is pretty cool. Again, this is not new. This goes all the way back to 1988 when Tim May, God rest his soul, wrote the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. And he predicted all the things that would happen with cryptographic security and that it was a better way to transact value. Now, the haters are going to hate. The people who are owning the trust industry, the banks, or the people who own a lot of banks like Warren Buffett, don't like it. And they're going to say it's bad. They're going to say it's a fraud. They're going to say it's rat poison. Of course they are. So if we think about, and this was our debate last night, what is cryptocurrency? What is Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is going to replace, ultimately, fiat currency. Fiat currency replaced gold. Gold was money for 5,000 years. We went off the gold standard in 1971 and we went on the fiat standard. And fiat, unfortunately, there's no fiat in the history of mankind that has ever survived, right? There were 775 paper currencies in the history of the world. Three quarters of them went away. The rest will go away because they're backed by debt. And debt ultimately has to get paid back or forgiven 
And when you do that, your currency gets wiped out. So cryptocurrency and particularly Bitcoin will ultimately be a better store of value. Digital assets are simply the evolution of technology for investing, just another portfolio tool. So in the olden days, you own gold. And then they're like, well, you could own some cash and bonds and still be a good fiduciary. Well, then they said, well, maybe you should own some equities. And then Arisa came in and said, well, maybe you should own some international equities and then some more developments. Maybe you should own some private equity and some real estate. And, and now we have digital assets, okay, that will ultimately be part of everyone's portfolio. So the digital divide is real. Ask anyone over 35, you know, who's your broker? Merrill Lynch, uh, UBS, why? How much gold do you have? Three, four uh, percent. How, how much Bitcoin do you have? Zero. Ponzi scheme. We had somebody last night from the HBS uh, audience say it was a Ponzi scheme. Like, if you call it a Ponzi scheme, you just don't know what a Ponzi scheme is because it's not a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> Fed debt might be a Ponzi scheme, but but Bitcoin's not. And how often people use DeFi, they don't even know what DeFi is. Ask anyone under 35 who's your broker. So I don't have a broker. What's a broker? They have a Robinhood account. How much gold do you have? Zero. That's a boomer rock. Uh, how much Bitcoin do you have? A lot. Uh, and how often do you use DeFi? Every day. So this boomer has embraced digital assets. Uh, his stock's up way more uh, than the market. Uh, you know, Bitcoin's up about 100% uh, off the bottom last November. MicroStrategy's up about 170. June was a really historic month. So basically everybody in the traditional world started suing everybody, trying to stop digital assets. So the SEC sued Binance, sued Coinbase, you know, but then BlackRock filed for an ETF. Now, wait a minute. This is the same guy that five years ago, I guess six years ago, called it an index of money laundering. Now he was on television on Monday saying people are afraid and there's a flight to quality, treasuries, gold, and Bitcoin. Or he said crypto, but he meant Bitcoin. So there are two Bitcoin ETF filings ahead of BlackRock. Well, at least there were. Uh, they've both been uh, deferred. That's 21 shares, Kathy Wood and uh, the Bitwise. Uh, who's going to win the race? It's going to be BlackRock. BlackRock's going to get approved. They, you know, The rumor was they got approved on Monday. It was a rumor. I think that was a trial balloon to see how it would, would play out. Um, or maybe it was a ploy to say, yeah, see, we told you there's manipulation because, you know, Bitcoin rallied 10% and then fell back about 7%, still up nicely. Um, but either way, I think BlackRock's going to get approved probably after the first of the year, maybe before that, but I'm, I'm going to say, you know, second, third week of January makes the most sense. Just like Top Gun, this is about combat. There are no points for second place. When the first Bitcoin futures ETF came out, they got 98% of the assets. Uh, this will happen to BlackRock. They'll get approved first. They'll get the bulk of the assets. And they'll probably take a lot of assets from GBTC too, if GBTC doesn't get uh, allowed to uh, approve. So the RIAs today that won't allow you to own Bitcoin, it's about $30 trillion. What if the advisors allocate 10 basis points. That's $30 billion. Now it's a $500 billion asset, half a trillion, but only about 100 billion of that really trades. So you're talking about 30 on 100, probably move the needle. But what if it's 1%? Then we got 300 billion chasing 100 billion. That's a big bull market. So here's the problem. Trying to own blockchain so if you just search the word blockchain and, and tried to buy everything in ETF form or mutual fund form that has the word blockchain in it, ugh, it has been painful over the past two years. Now, it's been less painful in the last you know nine months, but it's been painful. Uh, and that's because most of these companies have nothing to do with blockchain. They, you know, these ETFs own IBM and Microsoft and, and a bunch of other companies, uh, they don't have very much to do with blockchain, except for one thing. 
they own the public mining companies, the public Bitcoin mining companies. And those, many of them went bankrupt during the bear market and the public ones had too much leverage, bad decision. Uh, you know, leverage can never make a bad investment good. It can and often does make a good investment bad because you're forced to sell at the wrong time. So some of these have, have actually been, you know, great buys off the bottom, but it's been tough uh, to, to play blockchain in the public markets. Now, Bitcoin, on the other hand, is the best performing asset again this year in 2023, up almost 75%, uh, up significantly more than every other asset from Japanese stocks to the S&P to NASDAQ. 11 out of the 14 years that Bitcoin has been in existence, it's been the best performing asset. That's interesting. Now, there was actually a way to buy Bitcoin at a really big discount. You could have bought GBTC uh, in December at 50 cents on the dollar. So you basically could have bought a Bitcoin for 50 cents on the dollar. That discount has now closed to uh, the low 20s. And you can see, you know, GBTC on the left-hand side is up about 170% with Bitcoin up 70%. So that was a, and, and BITW is a, a similar thing. It, it had a big discount. It owns more than Bitcoin. It's owns Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and the top 10 crypto. Um, but either one of those, and remember, we're investors in, in Bitwise. So uh, C, computing infrastructure or chips, is all about analyzing data, processing data, uh, computer chips, semiconductors. Now, the history of computing infrastructure basically tracks this analog to electronic to digital. So this goes all the way back, you know, 3,000 years to the abacus and and then we had these Napier bones and the Pascaline and the Leibniz wheel. And there are all these, these physical mechanisms, these machines to help us count or to keep track of things. And then in the 40s, we had this innovation around computing. And we had the Mark I in 1944. And it was as big as a building. And so we went from machines, I mean, building size computers in the 40s to, you know, luggable computers in the 70s. And yeah, my first computer when I went to college was a, a K-Pro and it weighed about 19 pounds and uh, looked like a, a, a big lunchbox. And then in the 80s, we got, you know, the Mac kind of form factor. And then the 90s, we got the Dell form factor. And, and today we got laptops. And so that, you know, one and a half tons uh, was was a pretty bad estimate in 1949. Now, 75 years of the microprocessor. So in 1968, we had this uh, innovation. And Moore's law says that the number of transistors on a microchip doubles roughly every two years and the cost is halved. Okay, that's interesting. So in the 1950s, we had a single transistor, this is the upper right, on a chip. Today, right, we have... 330 billion <laughs> transistors on a chip. I mean, it's it's an incomprehensible number. And I love this quote, again, from 1989, Bill Gates saying, I think OS2 is destined to be the most important operating system and possibly the most important program of all time. And he said, we will never make a 32-bit operating system. Shouldn't say things like that because clearly uh, we went beyond 32 bit to 64 bit to 120, and we're going to keep improving. Now we're starting to reach the laws of physics, and we're going to need to change up materials. And I was just on a call today actually with a guy who's explaining that you know originally all these transistors, these little lines that you see uh, on the, the the chips, were done with aluminum. Well, aluminum has a point at which it, it actually melts and it, it becomes problematic. So then they, because there's heat generated with all these calculations. So then they changed to aluminum and copper and then changed to all copper. Now we're reaching the limit on copper and they've come up with an idea for replacing copper with something called graphene. And this is pretty revolutionary stuff. And, you know, if it works, which, you know, this professor at UC Santa Clara, Santa Clara, Santa Barbara, uh, believes that it can. And then there's a guy here at NC State who's working in gallium arsenide. So there are 
new materials and substrates that are going to push Moore's law even further and get us more uh, capacity. But you see the rate of growth in the lower right is starting to slow down, right? And it's just the law of large numbers, right? We can't pack that much more physically onto these little chips. The real key to uh, chips, though, is in the old days, there were no connected devices. So chips didn't need to be that that strong. And they could, you know, could have vacuum tubes and mainframe computers. But as we started connecting devices like client server and then the cloud, and in the future, hundreds of billions of connected devices, you can't function using single connection points like cloud computing uh, and networks. We've got to use mesh networks or, or blockchains. And so really the future is about chips that can power uh, blockchains. So in the old days, we had CPUs, central processing units. And then we went to GPUs, graphics processors. And then we went to field programmable FPGAs. And, and the guy that I was talking to today uh, actually created one of the first FPGAs and then sold it to NVIDIA, shocking. Um, NVIDIA buys all, all the great technology and they're, they're an amazing company. And, and really the, the race now is between NVIDIA, AMD and, and Intel is a, a distant third. Uh, and, and we're going from CPUs to GPUs to now TPUs, um, which I'm not even really sure I understand what a tensor programming unit or a VPU, but it's this change in the computing platforms, the, the way we combine chips, the way we combine substrates, the way we combine the technologies that really makes this work. So the next evolution of infrastructure is decentralized. So we were centralized at the beginning, we had mainframes and you basically had a mainframe and you did all your computing there and you walked up to it and you interacted with it and it wasn't connected to anything. Then we went to distributed networks and, and DARPA net and the beginnings of the internet. And, you know, before 1991, there were, you know, a handful of nodes connected to this thing and they talked to each other through hardwires and it cost a lot of money and, and but but we got to this point of client server technology. Then the internet was created in 1991 by Tim Berners Lee, and suddenly we had this thing www dot that allowed us to connect globally in real time, and still most of it was wired. And then in 2007, you know, we had this thing called the smartphone, and the smartphone came along and said, "Well, wait a second, we can do a lot of this wirelessly." And, you know, most of us worked in offices where, you know, you had all these plugs in the wall and you plugged your computer in and, and it was wired and it cost a lot of money. And, and now we all have a Wi-Fi hotspot and we connect through, through Wi-Fi. In the future, uh, we're going to go from the cloud. So all the computers used to be stored on-prem. Then they all moved to cloud. But the problem with cloud is it still centralized? It's still a single point of failure. You know, let's say the the data center, you know, gets attacked or hacked or floods or gets struck by lightning. It's still centralized and has what we want in the future is a decentralized cloud and a privacy protected cloud. And so there's all of these innovations around computing platforms and hardware that are going to be uh, massive in the future. So myriad investment opportunities. Uh, we've invested in one company called Chain Reaction. So they have this, this uh, product on the left that is a better ASIC, uh, which is a specific chip for doing Bitcoin mining or basically securing the Bitcoin blockchain. But on the right-hand side, uh, they're in stealth mode to create a new chip that would allow you to compute on encrypted data. And I can't even describe how big a deal this is. And there's four companies working on this. And if you think about it, if, if you have data or I have data on our phone or on our computer, it can be encrypted. If I send a message to you through WhatsApp or Telegram or Signal, it can stay encrypted. If I use iMessage, it's not encrypted and someone can steal it. If we put data out in the cloud, it can be encrypted. But the problem is when a company goes to the cloud to work on their data, they have to decrypt it. 
And that's where all the data breaches happen. And we've all heard about all the data breaches and all the customer information that's stolen. Well, these guys have figured out a way uh, using incredible processing power, you know, a thousand times more processing power, uh, which requires AI chips and specialized chips to actually be able to compute on your data, to, to analyze your data and, and interact with your data while leaving it encrypted. And it makes my head hurt to think about how it works, but it also makes my head hurt to think that I'm talking into a metal and glass box and you can hear me in real time. Um, I don't have to understand exactly how it works because there are people smarter than me that are doing that, but this is, this is a really big deal. Now, gaining exposure to chips, pretty simple, right? Um, there's NVIDIA, there's Broadcom, there's AMD, there's Applied Materials, there's Taiwan Semi, there's Intel, and even, you know, Intel, which has really been a, I don't say terrible, but but pretty poorly run company, which is not very nice to say, but it's been a pretty poorly run company for the past 20 years. Uh, they've lost their dominance uh, you know, stocks down 75% since 2000. Um, it's been basically surpassed by companies like NVIDIA, which have just absolutely crushed it. And so playing chips has, has been pretty easy. Now, you could also play the picks and shovels, right? You could you could buy the semiconductor tools companies like Kulik and Safa and... Uh, and uh, Marvel and and uh, not Marvel like the you know, like the, the comic book company, but uh, and ASML. And there's been more volatility. It's still outperformed the general markets, but hasn't done nearly as well as the chip companies themselves. All right, D, the big data, uh, the new oil. Uh, data is the new oil. Uh, data has to be captured, analyzed, and acted upon. Uh, I love this quote from from Dimit. Uh, too often we forget the genius depends on the data within its reach. Archimedes could not have devised Edison's inventions. It's amazing, right? It's not until we actually can access data and advances in technology. And as Newton said, I, I, I'm not that smart. I just build on the shoulders of giants. And, and then Jeffrey Moore says, without big data analytics, companies are blind and deaf, wandering out into the web like a deer on a freeway. Great. Uh, view. So what exactly is big data? Large, diverse, growing data sets. So basically, it's everything. It's medical records, it's traffic data, it's our writing style, it's our web logs, it's our purchasing patterns. Everything we do, everything we touch all day, every day is being recorded, being stored, and it is becoming big data. Now, this is unbelievable how, how big big data has become. So in 2010, Eric Schmidt said, there were five exabytes of information created between the dawn of civilization. Okay, that's a little bit of hyperbole. Uh, through 2003, okay? That much information is now being created every two days. Okay, that was in 2010. 13 years later, 13 years later, so there's there's the scan, you know, bits, bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes. Every single day, today, 329 exabytes of data will be created. And this is a couple of weeks old, so it's probably now 330 or 331. But five in all of history through 2003, computers since 1949, five exabytes of data. Now we create. 329 every single day. So big data is created from everywhere, right? And it's managed by these, these 10 Vs. There, there's the volume. We just talked about the volume. But then there's the validity, right? Is it good data? Is it bad data? Is it usable data? Is it in the right form? How fast is the data being created? How variable is it? Where are you collecting it from? Can it, you know, can it talk to one another? Is it uh, got high use case value. So business insights depend on analytics. So as I said, the ABC really are all about what we do with the data. So big data is about insight into our customers. So who's good at it? Pandora's really good at it. Amazon's really good at it. Um, 
Google used to be good at it. Now they're governed by ads and I can't get anything in, in the top page that is meaningful to me. Market intelligence, supply chain management, innovation. Innovation is accelerating in everything from biotechnology to computing science to material science because we can analyze ever increasing amounts of data. Now, if you think about the big data value chain, one of the biggest challenges, and I just did a big conference a couple weeks ago on this, uh, talking about this, is storage. If we're creating 329 exabytes of data every single day, what the hell do we do with it? So in the old days, right, analog storage, right, physical things, you know, we had file cabinets and and the like. Now, imagine trying to put all that data in file cabinets. You know, there wouldn't be enough file cabinets. We wouldn't have enough steel to make the file cabinets. Digital storage is exploding. The angle of ascent of that, that funnel on the right-hand side is absolutely exploding. And, and we can't use CDVDs, right? You saw that uh, today, who announced they're getting out of the DVD business? Oh, Walmart or no, Best Buy, Best Buy. So they're not going to sell DVDs, it's just a stupid thing. And we can't do it on hard drives anymore. We've got to do it in a distributed storage way. So big data stocks, they just took off, right? So you got these companies like Palantir and and uh, Elastic and uh, Teradoc. Um, all of these uh, companies have done really, really well, right? Market's up about 15%. They're up 30, 40, 50, 100 plus percent. And that's because people realized that with AI, there was going to be an acceleration in the rate of growth so, you know, a third derivative impact on, on big data. So beyond the ABCDs, uh, the emerging web three protocol stack. So the old protocol stack uh, from web two, web one was IP at the bottom, internet protocol, then TCP IP at the base layer, FTP to move files, HTTP for websites, SMTP for email, and www dot that ties it all together. The blockchain technology stack, Okay. has an infrastructure layer, a network layer, the protocol layer, the protocol itself, services, and then the applications, the decentralized, the dApps. Now, Web3 takes advantage of the ABCDs. So it's about this idea of the semantic web. So read, write, own, a true peer-to-peer -peer economy. Right? It uses artificial intelligence. It uses uh, faster chips. It uses increased connectivity. It uses all the things in the ABCDs to create a web experience that is more, uh, more personal, more personalized, uh, more prone to uh, ownership of, of your own data. Uh, and I use a simple example of a cookie, right? So you got cookies on your computer and companies pay for access to those cookies to see where you went. Well, how about if we owned those cookies in an NFT form and we could decide who got to look at them and we got paid? Kind of a cool idea. So in Web 1 and Web 2, the vast majority of the value went to the application layer. 97 plus percent went to the application layer. The protocol, TCP IP, you can't own it. In Web3, a huge amount is going to the protocol layer. That's really cool. You can actually own the protocol, like Bitcoin, Ethereum. And so as we think about this, applications were all the rage in Web1 and Web2. Today, there will be decentralized apps and there will be opportunities to invest in them. And, and we've invested in a number of them in the funds, but it's that combination of investing in both the protocol layer directly and the applications. So uh, the protocol stack in web three is being defined in real time. Uh, there are a lot of companies that are uh, investable uh, in the private markets, uh, and you can buy the protocols themselves, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Filecoin, et cetera. So uh, if we think about the Web3 primitives, you know, what are the things that are going to matter 
in Web3? Well, there's identity, digital identity. There's, there's compute, you know, computing power. There's the communication uh, across the network. There's storage. Uh, and then there's, you know, storing of value. And if you think about the Bitcoin blockchain, it will become the global sediment layer for all value in the world. Pretty big statement, but that's probably what it's going to become. And storage is going to become an increasing opportunity for something like uh, a Filecoin. <laughs> so the use cases are clear. Uh, builders are going to build, lots of companies building. Look, in the last crypto winter, we saw a bunch of companies started that have become you know, billion dollar plus unicorn. Uh, the current uh, wave, right? In the current downturn, we've seen a lot of companies uh, get created. But what's more interesting is no one told all these big companies from banks to transportation companies, to healthcare companies, to real estate, energy. No one told them that blockchain was a fad. So they are all spending billions of dollars and moving on chain. So if you care, uh, we do around the world uh, and make these available. We also do digital currents. Uh, we've done a number of, of new digital currents that are, are really interesting that uh, I think you'll like. And I will answer a couple questions here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the age of steel is misspelled. I love that. Um, maybe it was the age of steel because, uh, you know, Titan, John D. Rockefeller was, was kind of a he, he was not such a good, nice guy. And then another point on uh, search uh, becoming a, a top AI use case. So absolutely. Well, it doesn't look like there are any more questions I've run. Oh, no, I'm, I'm two minutes under. So again, thank you. If you do have questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to let us know. Uh, you can do IR at morgancreekcap.com or you can you know text us directly. Um, we appreciate your partnership and support, and we'll talk to you again next week. See ya.